All right, today we're talking about springs and elastic potential energy. Okay, uh, so obviously to start our discussion of springs, let's take a look at a spring. Uh, here we've got a spring. What I wanna do to this spring is, is just say we're gonna start with this spring as some initial length L, if you wanna call it that. Um, it has some initial length. This spring is just relaxed. It's, it's unstretched, it's uncompressed. It's just sitting there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna stick this spring up against a wall. We're gonna allow it to rest on the floor, which is nice and frictionless. So this spring has this initial length, L initial. And what I wanna do, of course, is push on this spring or pull on this spring. Now, if we push on the spring to say compress it, that is to make it shorter, the push with some force F, the spring is captive up against the wall. So as I push, it's going to become shorter. It is going to contract this way. And so the length is going to change. So as I push on the spring, we're going to find that the length shrinks. And so ultimately you could go through and even say, the end of the spring is going to go through some displacement. And what we're going to deal with in here is something called ideal springs. I'll explain to you what an ideal spring is because it's very important given the math and the consequences of the math moving forward. So we're going to go through and graph the force on the y-axis as a function of the displacement. So if I was to go through in an experiment like this and compress this spring one centimeter and measure the force required to do that. Collect some data. Uh, if I was to compress it then two centimeters, then three centimeters, then four centimeters. What we would find for what we call an ideal spring is that the farther we want to compress the spring, the greater the force required. And really what we get, the important thing that we would get out of this is the relationship between the compression of this spring and the force required to compress it at a certain displacement. We would find that that's linear. So whenever we see a linear relationship between force and displacement for a spring, what we're talking about is an ideal spring. This ideal spring results in this linear relationship between force and displacement. That's how we even define an ideal spring. We would say an ideal spring has a linear relationship between force and displacement. And this has lots and lots of uses for us. Uh, so the first thing I wanna look at is just look at this spring itself. Let's say I took a, a very weak spring. Maybe this is something like a spring inside of a little clicky top pen or a mechanical pencil. Okay, and there's springs in there but they're not very stiff. How would this look if we were to deal with something different, like say a car spring? Something that's holding up a whole bunch of, of mass, some spring that has to be really, really stiff. Well, let's say I wanted a stiffer spring. I took a second spring and I wanted to compress it a certain distance. Let's say, I'm gonna just call this X naught, some value or x, let's not call it x naught, let's call it x sub one. x naught would imply it's, it's not compressed at all. So I wanna compress this some certain distance. Well, for this original spring, it only takes a little bit of force. We'll even call it a little force. With a stiffer spring, to compress that stiffer spring, the same displacement, we would expect it to re require more force. So what we'd actually find if we had, say, a, a different or a second spring that was stiffer. So we would find this curve, or really this diagonal line, was steeper. It's still an ideal spring. That is to say, it's still linear. Relationship between force and displacement. It's just that the slope is steeper. So the way we talk about springs and how stiff they are really has to do with their slope. So the slope of either of these in physical terms is the stiffness. 
And you can even see this has units. Uh, if we look at this on the y-axis, we have force, which is measured in newtons, uh, at, at least in most of the world. And then we have displacement, which we could measure in meters. And so the slope actually has units of newtons per meter. This is what we call the K value. This is an important value for a spring. Right? This is something we call the K value, measured in newtons per meter. And if you look at all this, what you see is a stiffer spring has a higher K value. That is to say, it requires more force for a given compression. Try to pull a spring off of your car and compress it one centimeter. You'll find it's much, much harder than it is to compress a uh, spring off of a little clicky top pencil like this one. Uh, it takes a whole lot more force. It's stiffer. There are more Newtons required per meter of compression. And with this, we can even create an equation for this. If we wanted to go through and create an equation for this line, we could say the force required to compress the spring is going to be the spring constant, that is the slope of the line, multiplied by the displacement of the spring. Really, what we're looking at is point slope for this line, or as you talk about it in, in math class, your, your slope intercept. Uh, so, this equation is really our equation for a spring. So whether you call this F sub S, that is the force by a spring, or you want to sound a little more fancy, call it F sub E, that is the elastic force. That's cool, great. Now there's a catch here. Right? Well, this equation isn't complete the way it is. And in fact, the way I've drawn this graph is a little bit misleading. And be for one reason, it ignores sign. I want you to imagine I pushed on this spring with some force F to the left and the displacement was then to the left. That's what we graphed here. But if I push on this spring to the left with some force F, which way is this spring pushing back the other way? Remember, a spring is always trying to get back to equilibrium, back to its relaxed length. It's trying to, wait for it, spring back to its original length. Uh, so what we're doing here in this graph is really graphing the force required to compress the spring. If we were going to show the force by the spring, all these values would have been negative. That is to say, if I push the spring to the left, the force is to the right by the spring. So if I look at this equation, if I was to put in, say, a positive value for displacement here, we really think the spring is going to be pulling to the left. So that means I need to put a negative here. This negative means this force by the spring or the elastic force is restoring. That is to say it is pushing it back to equilibrium. This negative is actually a pretty big deal. So this is the equation, the actual equation for the force by a spring for really an ideal spring. We can get into more complicated springs, things like uh, air trapped in a cylinder. We'll get to that later, you'll see. Uh, but the reason we're talking about this, this force by a spring, all of a sudden when we're dealing with energy, we've been talking about energy for several lectures here, suddenly we're talking about forces by a spring, and there's an important reason. Here, I want you to realize that this force is a function of position, and that's important. And to talk about how this is important, I want to go back up to our definition of work. Work being F dot D, which we don't really care about or FD cosine theta, which we use a lot, or this mythical and strange F of X DX. And so what I want to do first is look at this situation in terms of this way of looking at force right here, FD cosine theta. If I push on the spring to the left, the spring is pushing back to the right with some force following this equation. And so, let's say we took this spring and we started with this spring in a nice compressed state. That is to say, we already pushed it around some. The last length of this spring is somewhere over here. And I let this spring go. Maybe the spring is gonna push a box or, or something like that. 
I'll put a box right here. And let this go. The spring wants to get all the way back to this initial or relaxed length of this spring. So the spring is going to push on the box. So it's going to be a force this way by the spring. And that spring is going to do work. All right. So we know according to this equation, the force by the spring is going to be given by negative kx. So here I've got some displacement. So if I knew this displacement, I could find the magnitude of the force by the spring. And as the spring moves, it's gonna do work. The problem is, as the spring moves back towards equilibrium, going back to our graph over here, as the spring moves back towards equilibrium, the magnitude of force by the spring is going to change. The closer and closer the spring gets to equilibrium, the smaller the force by the spring will be. And so we cannot use an equation like this to go through and find how much work this spring is gonna do on this block, pushing it to the right. This equation is dependent on this force right here being constant. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna allow this block to push, or sorry, we're gonna allow the spring to push the block forward just a teeny tiny little bit. In fact, I'm gonna say we're gonna push it forward such a teeny tiny little bit, it's gonna be an infinitely small little bit, which we're gonna call dx. The spring is gonna push the block forward an infinitely small amount. And in that infinitely small amount, the force will effectively be constant. You're saying, yes, but it's decreasing as the, as the block moves forward. That's true. But as I move, let the spring relax an infinitely small amount, according to this equation, there will be an infinitely small change in force. It'll be constant. So we're going to allow a tiny little bit of work to get done. So going back to using this equation, we're going to allow a tiny little bit of work to be done. How tiny? Well, I'm going to say it's an infinitely small chunk of work is going to be done. And that little bit of work that's going to be done by the spring is going to be our force by the spring. That's negative kx multiplied by dx. So we've got some work dx. Now, as I allow this spring to go farther and farther and farther towards equilibrium and to relax more and more, it's going to do lots of work. In fact, you can go through and you say, we're going to do this infinitely small amount of work an infinite number of times in moving the spring from here to here. So the total work done is going to be the infinite sum of all of our little works. That is the infinite sum of negative kx dx. Now I want you to think about what this means physically. We're going to add up all of the little works done by this spring. I want you to think about what this means from a mathematical perspective. What we have is we're integrating this function with respect to x. Realize I didn't just slap an x on or dx on the end of this like you might in calculus class because, well, you're used to integrating with respect to x in there. This dx has a meaning. It's this, this infinitely small little distance we're allowing the block to move or the spring to relax as it pushes this block. So, in going through and looking at this, if we evaluate this integral from the initial position to the final position, that is to say, let's let the spring relax completely, we're gonna get some work done. That is the total work done by the spring as it relaxes. So the total work done by the spring as it relaxes is going to be one half negative K X squared evaluated from X to zero. Or if I flip my limits of integration, I get the work by the spring is gonna be one half K X squared evaluated from zero to X. And if I actually go through and evaluate this, I'm gonna find the work is equal to one half K X squared, where X is initially how far the spring is compressed. And this is an extremely important result, and I'll explain why. This equation right here is ultimately the energy that was initially stored in the spring. 
it is the work that the spring did in, in relaxing and pushing this block forward. So this equation right here, this is our function for the energy stored in a spring. And you'll see we arrived at this through applying our calculus version of work. At least we sort of arrived at this. Really, we started here. But we used this function and integrated it cleverly. We wound up here. And so hopefully what you see in looking at this problem is that this formula is really just the slightly more complicated version of this. It applies in a situation when our force is a function of position, as we saw here. And so you'll see this more formally written often as elastic potential energy, that is the energy stored in the spring, is one half k x squared. Now once you be careful, realize this only ever applies to ideal springs. Now whether you call this potential with an E for elastic or the potential with an S for spring potential, I, I just don't care, all right? People who do care, they've got a lot of free time. But this equation right here, is the energy stored in a spring when we compress it. That is the energy that could be released if we allowed that spring to relax. Um, that is the energy required for us or some external agent to compress the spring. But this becomes a very, very useful equation as we move forward. So with that in mind, that's all for now.